Hello and welcome to the final day of MD&DI's Focus on Fundamentals course, How to Develop a Risk-Based Biological Safety Evaluation per New U.S. FDA Guidance, sponsored by Nelson Laboratories. I'm your host, Tanya von Grumkow, Program Manager of UBM Americas. Before we get started, I have a few items to get through. First, the slides will advance for you. If you would like to download the slide deck, click on the Today's Slide Deck under Educational Resources a little further down the page. Please ask questions at any time during the presentation by typing your question in the question and answer box. Submit questions as they come to mind and our speaker will address them during the Q&A session as time permits. The public chat box is for you to share thoughts and ideas on today's topic with each other. And finally, at the end of the course, we will ask you to complete a short survey. Please take a moment to fill this out as your feedback is important to us and will provide valuable information on the subjects covered in this course, as well as how we can improve future broadcasts. Now on to today's class. Summarize all your findings in a Biological Evaluation Report, or BER, presented by Audrey Turley, research scientist at Nelson Laboratories. Audrey has 20 years of experience working in research, laboratory, and test design functions in the medical device industry. She is a biocompatibility expert having performed all the in vitro tests offered at Nelson Laboratories. For more on Audrey, please see her bio under Featured Speakers. Audrey, I will now hand it off to you. Thank you, Tanya, and welcome everyone to our third day of this class. I thought it would be good to begin with a summary slide to review what we've talked about and how this fits into your biological safety evaluation. Um, what we start with first is a biological evaluation plan, or a BEP. So this is the stage where you're identifying what your risks are and then laying out a plan to mitigate those risks. And the second part is the testing and risk assessments. This was covered by Dr. Campbell yesterday, and she really focused a lot on the extractable and leachable testing that can be used to justify out of testing or to address um, any issues you see during your testing. And this area would also include any in vitro or in vivo animal testing as well. And then the third part of this is the biological evaluation. And this is really where we define, is your device safe? to give a summary for day one and just reiterate some of the points that Thor talked about when he went over a biological evaluation plan. So what I've put up here is a small version, uh, just a portion of the table that's in the FDA guidance document where this is how we're addressing and helping to identify the risks that a, dev that a device may pose to a patient. One of the big points we're trying to bring home is that Assessing your biocompatibility is not a checklist approach. It is not merely going to this table and doing every test where there's an X or an O. It's understanding if that's a real risk to your patient and then performing the necessary tests or justifying why they are not necessary. Another point that he brought up was to submit a BEP to the regulatory bodies before you begin. In our experience, in talking with these regulatory reviewers, they really want to foster a better relationship in the beginning so that it's not at the end that you find out something was missed or there was a disconnect. Those are the two main points for day one. Day two with Dr. Campbell really focused on knowing your material and performing useful extractable and leachable testing and following that up with a risk assessment. I want to give a quick shout out to somebody who helped her with her presentation was um, John Ioni, who we have worked with at Toxicon, who helped um, with some of her presentation that she gave, where we really talked about the central part of the ISO 10993-1, figure one, where you're asking yourself these questions so you can assess and come up with that plan to mitigate the risks that you've identified. That's a summary for the first and second day of presentations. And for day three, I just wanted to point out the standards that I'm going to reference in my presentation. It's going to be ISO 10993-1. Now this one is on how to evaluate and perform testing within a risk management process. And this standard is not available for free. You do need to purchase it, but you can go online and do that. If you just search this document, several offer, um, will come up where you can purchase this. Next one is the US FDA guidance document. 
This one is for free online. Next slide here. I have went ahead and put a live link. If that does not work, uh, we went ahead and put the link in the chat, the public chat. It's one of the first few entries there. It's under Thor Rollins. So if you are not able to access the live link on this slide, go ahead and get the link there. I wanted to put it up so that um, to make note of what they say here is that even though this was published in June, as of, as of September 14th, this will now supersede the Blue Book Memorandum G95. And they are already reviewing to this standard. Um, important to note that you need to be in tune with what's going on even before it comes up. Okay. So let's start in with um, what is a BER. This really is a summary of all the evidence gathered to support the biological safety of a device. And this specifically is requested in the US FDA guidance document and in Clause 7 and Annex B of ISO 10993-1. Now the BER is also asked for and reference multiple times in Dash 1, but in Clause 7 and Annex B, this is where they outline specific requirements that help you to write your BER. So you may be asking yourself, why do I need a BER? Well, if you can look at this decision tree that is lined out in, lined out in 10993-1, it is not a straightforward path. You may be able to compare your device to some materials on the market, but without having proprietary information, if this is not your device, you are left to do some testing on your own specific device. So I've identified here in the table where a BEP comes into play under selection of biological tests and where you perform your testing and risk assessments here. And it looks like it's towards the end. So I also want to point out that there's quite a bit of work that goes into designing your plan before you even get to that point that is done at the manufacturer facility before you involve the laboratory. So here we're at part two, we're test looking at testing and risk assessments. And then we do the BER at the end where we're performing this evaluation. And if the conclusion of your BER is the device is safe, then you can say that the biological evaluation is complete. So I'm sure in the past many people have just submitted their testing reports. And so you may be asking, why can I not just still do this? Well, just submitting the testing reports leaves a lot of room for assumptions, and the reviewers honestly are not going to make those assumptions. What they want to see in a BER is your scientific reasoning for why your device is safe. So those connections need to be made. So I have this diagram here with an implant device that had a predicate device submitted. They also did some extractable and leachable testing on the predicate device. And then on the actual, on their device, they performed cytotoxicity, irritation, and sensitization. And then in those biocompatibility tests, there were some particulates identified. So then they did some particulate testing with a biological risk assessment to determine if those particulates were a risk. If all of these data reports were simply submitted with no connection or logic bringing them all together to support the, the main implant device, there are several gaps that can be made, can be left. This actually did happen um, where just testing reports were submitted and the regulatory agency came back and they had over 30 points that had to be addressed separately, noting that no connection was made for, for several points of testing that were submitted maybe under the predicate device, but there was no documentation to support that the predicate and the implant device were relatable. So projects can be complex, and it is important to summarize your findings and present your case to your reviewers. So at this point, I thought it would be good to go over what a BER should contain. Now this is outlined out of ISO 10993-1 in Clause 7, for the section titled Interpretation of Biological Evaluation Data and Overall Biological Safety Assessment. So they have seven points, A through G, where they've identified what, what should be included in this final evaluation. 
And the first part under A is the section, or the, excuse me, the strategy and program content for the biological evaluation of the medical device. So this is where we are laying out what the evaluation plan was. Part B, the criteria for determining the acceptability of the material for the intended purpose in line with the risk management plan. Now this would typically be done far before you are presenting a final device for testing. So in this section of the report, it should reference some internal documentation from your R&D process or a device history file where you have that information listed. Part C, the BER should also contain the adequacy of the material characterization. It's important to note, because it's not quite clear what they're looking for here, but it depends on what you are doing with the material characterization data. So if you have performed some chemistry testing and you are justifying out of testing, out of performing in vivo or in vitro testing, that material characterization data needs to be sufficient and um, a toxicological risk assessment needs to have been performed on that data. Uh, let's see, the next situation is if you are using a well-characterized material, let's say a stainless steel, um, you would simply need to note and maybe do a, a literature research on that material. So it wouldn't need to be as in-depth of a material characterization of, as having your own chemistry testing. Um, and then another case is if you have a novel material or a new process, then there is a far heavier burden that needs to be, that is carried with this. So the agencies are looking for more material characterization data simply because there won't be enough information in the literature for us to research. So that will need to be provided and performed through your company on your device. Okay, part D for what should be contained in a BER, the rationale for selection and or waiving of tests. This will reference back to the biological evaluation plan as well, where that is determined by the device categorization based on contact type and duration, and then any other parallel standards that were identified that need to be followed for the type of device and patient contact. And for part E, the interpretation of existing data and results of testing. This is an important section, as you will just submit your reports anyways. It, when you write a BER, the reports will be in there for the testing that was performed. But what is important is that that data was actually reviewed before it is submitted. And I'll tell you a one situation that we had recently that was interesting. In a review of a sensitization report, I went straight to the conclusion, and it was noted in there by the laboratory that the device was considered a non-sensitizer. Um, so I went ahead and thought, okay, I'm going to review the rest of the data here. And when I looked up in the report, actually two animals died during the course of the testing. Now, the, the laboratory noted that the animals did not die due to the medical device or the application of the device to the animal. However, in the standards, it is required to have so many data points in order to fully assess sensitization. So even though the animals didn't die um, from the medical device, they did die and therefore they were missing the necessary data points to fully assess their sensitization. So it's important when you're reviewing your data that comes back from the laboratories that you full that you that somebody is reviewing that who has the knowledge and the experience, knowing not just what's required in the test, but also what the standards require. This is also a great area to address any unusual findings if you fail the test, or maybe you have a known um, cytotoxic material, which is a common a material a common finding in medical devices you can address the risk in this section of your BER. Okay, part F for what should a BER contain, it should also contain the need for any additional data to complete the biological evaluation. So this would be an area to identify any gaps. So this can happen when you've had extended evaluations where there's a change in standards that have occurred since the testing was performed and when submission is actually occurring. And then for part G, this is the final conclusion, an overall biological safety conclusions for the medical device. 
Have all the risks been mitigated, and can we now say that the device is safe? So with this information, you may be asking yourself, can I write a BER myself? Well, the answer is yes, of course you can. In the SEA guidance document, attachment C, they've listed an example here of a summary table that could be presented for your biocompatibility evaluation. I wanted to note a couple of things from this example, however, that it is organized by biological endpoint. I've made a note, I've put an arrow here to identify that. And we can see from the information that is outlined in the ISO guidelines that they are looking for more than just biological endpoint information. So ensure when you do, if you do your own BER, ensure that all the points in Clause 7 are included. And I just wrote a summary here for, um, of the seven points that are asked for in, in the ISO guidance document. So really quickly, a strategy to assess the device, justification for materials used, and was the material character characterization adequate, the rationale for selection or waiving of tests, your data review and interpretation, and were there any gaps or anything left uncovered, and is the device safety well supported? At this point, I want to push out a poll question and here's the question. Have you had a regulatory response on a submission that could have been addressed by submitting a BER? So I'm going to take a break and let everyone have a moment to answer that poll question. Like we've got a couple. When we get a few in, I'll, I'll finish this and publish it for everyone to see. And I believe the, the poll comes up on the right-hand side of the presentation. Okay, I'm going to let a few more answers come in here. Okay, great. I will publish this. Okay, so it looks like almost half and half where this has happened. Okay, that's great. Okay, so back to the presentation. Um, Finishing up, can you write a BER yourself? So those of you who've had this experience where you've had some response come back that if you had done a BER, uh, maybe it would have gone a little bit more smoothly. Here's some things to keep in mind when you're deciding if you're going to do the BER yourself or have that be done um, by us. So in ISO 10993-1, it states that expert assessors should review the findings and make an overall conclusion. With my example of you know, going over the sensitization report when that data review is occurring, it's important that when these final reports come into your facility that somebody with enough education and experience is reviewing these to understand the full repercussion of the results. Another thing that's always nice is that it's great to have an outside perspective. Sometimes when you're a little too close to the project, you're not sure if the risks you're taking are appropriate. And then um, help with submission process if it comes back. So um, we are always happy to help with a submission that's, that needs some additional input. We can come in at any time, but it is nice when we've already done the work up front and, and we do support our product through to the end. Okay, so I thought at this point it would be great to go over how we address um, all the points in Dash in 10993-1 for a BER. So how I've organized this is that the blue diagram on the right-hand side in the center block is the title of our sections. And then the outside blocks in blue are information that can be contained in that section. And then I've also identified in the orange square what, what part of 10993-1 is covered here. So our first section that we're addressing is the background. We really want to come in and give the backstory on the company, the device, and why this is being submitted. It's, not, it's usually not just a straightforward approach anyway, so this is a great point to, to lay anything out on the table what's going on. So this references back to a BEP. We kind of just start this introduction saying why we are here and what's going on. And the second section that we cover is a device description. 
So this is where we will talk about a target population, where it is used in the body, its intended function. Um, and this starts with the justification for materials used. When we start to identify what the device is, and then later on we say these materials are common in this type of device, we've already given the specifics of where it's used and what it's used for. The next section is the device categorization. So this is based purely off of ISO 10993-1, um, where we will talk about device contact, the duration, and the typical biological considerations used. Another thing that we'll include in this area is any parallel standards. You know, if it's a cardiovascular device, if it is a gas pathway device, some of those have different standards that have additional considerations that need to be addressed. So for the, the points covered in Clause 7, we're addressing again our BEP. We're discussing what endpoints need to be addressed and why. And then we're saying, um, we're justifying maybe what tests were or were not done in this area as well, based on those parallel standards. So the next section would be a components and materials section. This really can be anything that you want it to be. So we can go into as much detail or as little detail as you would like, but it's great here to lay out that you are aware of your components and your materials. And that may seem a little, um, elementary, but it's important that you are just laying that out on the table for the reviewer so that they understand that there's open communication about what is in your device. So we will talk about um, your suppliers, any C of A's or COC's, um, certificates of compliance, and then we can present any material biocompatibility data that these suppliers may have for you, which is great information if you start with a biocompatibil biocompatible material. And again, this covers section B, which was identified in ISO dash, or clause seven for justification for materials used. And then we come to the testing summary. So this can be um, the longest section in the BER where we will identify tests performed, the laboratory that performed them, standards that were followed, identify study numbers. And at this point, we can also reference the testing reports as appendices or if you're using this, depending on how you're submitting this, we can reference it however you're using your internal documentation here. And then we'll give a results section where we summarize the findings. And it's, this is a great place to identify points of concern for these reviewers, that they wanna see consistency across the board, like extraction parameters and solvents that are used. And then this is another area where we can address any abnormal results and justify those if needed. And so this will, and, and then also in this area, we will cover any extractable and leachable testing that was performed to justify or to cover any of the um, other biological endpoints where you didn't do animal or in vitro testing. So again, we would have a discussion at a, a, according to 10993-1 part seven for was the material characterization adequate and then we perform the data review and interpretation. And we can also identify if everything was covered here, if there were gaps in the testing. And then we would have a discussion for the risk assessments that were performed. So if risk assessments were used for any of the biological endpoints, we would not necessarily redo the assessments at this point. We would reference them and summarize their conclusion. And so this also addresses was the material characterization adequate. You can see we're covering this at several points in it, throughout the BER because it's not a one point conversation. It does flow and cover several areas of your biological evaluation. And um, again, we'll do a data review and interpretation and uh, linking that back to any chemistry testing that was done. And then was everything covered? Did the risk assessment cover everything and come to a good conclusion for the device safety? And then at the end, we make our final conclusion. So I put some examples of some different conclusions that we've had. Um, of course, the device is considered biocompatible. That's the end goal that we're all hoping for. Um, but every now and again, we'll come up against something where there are remaining areas of risks that, risks that need to be addressed. Or the device is safe for only the following populations. This last conclusion would really come through a toxicological risk assessment. 
and Dr. Campbell spoke about that yesterday, where we're basing these um, threshold levels on body weight and these safety margins. And so if the device or the compound coming off is not safe for a pediatric or neonatal population, we would also identify that here in the conclusion. So you can see at this point, it's beneficial to reference your risk assessments and all of the testing that's included to give a final conclusion here. Instead of having these individual reports where they, the reviewers expected to find all that information. So we know not everything comes up in a neat little picture. Um, so what if, there's all these different scenarios, what if you didn't have a BEP, um, like a formal written plan? That is fine. We can still identify what the plan, the plan of action that was taken in the BER and outline that and proceed with the report. What if the testing was done over several years? Um, this has happened quite a bit, and what I recommend at this point is to not start with a BER, but start with a gap analysis where we can identify if anything is missing before we make a full conclusion about the device. So if the testing is done several years ago or you're using a predicate where the testing was done several years ago, start with a gap analysis and decide if that testing is still appropriate. And then if you find that it is, go ahead and write a conclusion report, like a biological evaluation report for those findings. What if the device has gone through several design changes since the testing? This one can be a little bit more difficult because if there were not assessments done at each design change, the relevancy of the testing done originally and the current product could be very discrepant, and so it's important to have a, an assessment performed at that. And so you can still do a BER, but I would recommend that you start um, with a phone call with one of our consultants to ensure a path of, more, of, um, of success for that submission to make sure we're addressing that appropriately. And then what if you're putting all of this together as an afterthought, everything has been done? That's fine. The BER does not need to be done um, if you've already submitted but you need some internal documentation. The BER is great to have on file so that you know where everything stands at that point. So I wanted to give some examples that we've used before um, for projects that we've done. Uh, in a catheter family, this one we had, there were several different catheters in a family and they were different sizes and different lengths. And with those different sizes and different lengths also came different colors of ports. And um, if you guys couldn't guess from Dr. Campbell's presentation and Thor's presentation, colorants are an issue. And so you want to make sure when you have a family and there's so many different colorants that could be used that all of those colorants are assessed in your evaluation. And so what happened with this project is um, we helped to identify an, a representative sample. And so we looked through all of the materials and all of the different colorants and the different sizes and we picked a worst case scenario and then the manufacturer made a sample of a device, not that they marketed, but of a device that they were going to use to do all of their testing on. So out of a family of, oh, let's say, nine catheters, Instead of doing all the biocompatibility, which is extensive, on nine, they could do it on one. So in the BER, under the um, materials conversation, material and components conversation, we were able to have a conversation about the making of this representative sample and scientifically justify why this should be the representative sample for the family. And then go ahead, uh, we went through the rest of the report and assessed the testing and then we were able to conclude that this testing will support the biological safety of all the devices or all the catheters in the family. Um, another example is with latex gloves. Um, as we know, latex is a common cytotoxic material, and so, but this material is also found in the industry. So we went ahead and reviewed the latex found in the gloves and did a literature review on, with the history of latex and then supported the safety of the gloves through further testing. And so um, this is a way to address if you have a known cytotoxic material but based on the patient exposure, the risk is low. 
Um, and of course, these will be identified as latex gloves, so those with um, issues can avoid them, but they've addressed and mitigated that risk as far as they could. Another example is a kit that has several components, and these components are purchased at separate facilities and then manufactured at one, and put together at one location. So the manufacturer of the kit performs testing and it is failing cytotoxicity. After doing some investigation, come to find out it's one component of this kit that causes the failing cytotoxicity results. So at this point, we can assess that one component and the materials in that component. We did a literature review of, and we had um, known amounts, so we were able to do some calculations to determine the safety. Well, what we came up against, and Dr. Campbell talked about this yesterday, is that in that literature review for one of those compounds, it's, it did not have enough published literature for us to fully assess its safety. So at that point, we had to go back and get some more data. We did some additional testing. And with that data plus the literature review and passing results for the other biocompatibility tests, we were able to show that this device ended up being safe. Um, and then this last example I wanted to give here uh, with the predicate device. So this was from a same manufacturer. They wanted to, they were making a new device, a very similar catheter to one on the market, but it was going to be shorter. And so instead of testing this additional catheter and through all the biocompatibility testing again, they were able to use the data from their first catheter with some reasoning and pointing out the materials and processes for both catheters being similar, they were able to use that and say that this new catheter did not need any testing. It was able to be shown that it was safe based on the testing of their predicate device. And so for this one, I just wanted to point to something that was mentioned in the ISO, uh, the US FDA guidance document, where they talk about use of um, predicate devices. It's great when you're using one of your own devices as a predicate device because you have all the proprietary information on the processes and the materials that is not usually shared if you take a competitor's predicate device because you really don't know all of the details typically on that. So these were some great examples of um, projects for BERs and how we put that all together and why an evaluation report is really beneficial because none of this was straightforward. So I just wanted to finish up today with a summary. Again, just going back to the slide, I think it bears repeating that you start with step one, a biological evaluation plan. What are your risks and how, to, how are you mitigating those risks? And remember, it's not a checklist approach or check, checkbox approach. And then part two, the testing and risk assessments. So perform the testing and do the risk assessments where necessary. Dr. Campbell pointed out some of the price and time benefits of doing extractable and leachable testing with the risk assessment versus just doing all of the animal testing. And then today, um, part three, following up with your biological evaluation report, identifying if your device is safe. Do not leave room for assumptions for the reviewers because they simply won't make them. It will just create work on the back end for you. So make those justifications and, um, and then support that biological safety through to the end. And I'm going to turn it back over to Tanya for question and answers. Great. Thank you, Audrey. Um, if the audience, you have questions, please submit it now using the question and answer box. If we are not able to answer all the questions, we will share the remaining questions with our speaker and she will respond to you directly via email. So let me get over to our Q&A tab here. And our first question for you, Audrey, is if I just follow the testing outline in uh, negative one, why would I still need to do a BER? That is a great question. Um, so the testing outline in the uh, dash one is good to follow, but if you noticed in the FDA guidance document, there were some of those categories that actually had zeros, so they have X's and O's, and those O's signify testing that may need to be addressed or they would like you to address. So um, 
those, if you do all of that and you submit it and you have a straightforward approach, then the summary table that was listed in attachment C of the guidance document that I put up on the slide, that's a great way to present it in a very simple evaluation report. Um, the regulatory agencies are asking for these reports to be done so that they can have a summary of the approach that you've used. And so even if it's a straightforward, simple approach, you can also do a straightforward, simple biological evaluation report as well. So if you have a simple one, do a simple report. If it's more complex, you may need some help drawing those conclusions. Okay, great. On to our next question. Um, FDA China did not even consider looking at our BER and insisted that we submit animal testing reports, a checkbox approach. Is it common for Chinese regulatory or, or we just got an old style reviewer? If we hit a wall like this with regulatory, do we just accept the requirements? That is a great question, and that brings highlights a point that is important to remember that um, the success of your submission is always so reviewer dependent. And so we see all these guidance documents coming out, and the reviewers may choose to have a differing opinion from those. As much as they say that they follow them, we have found it to be very different in the agency. So when you submit to China and they come back and they want this checklist approach, um, Hopefully, in your BER, you've done the actual testing, and, and it really depends if they're going to accept any type of a risk assessment. We have had great success with the U.S. and with Europe, and I think the other agencies will be catching up, but it may be down the road. So if they ask for that BE, if they ask for the animal testing, you can try and have a conversation with them again and see if they'll accept a a B, I'm assuming that maybe it was a BEP that was submitted and not a BER, um, you know, your plan that they just wanted you to do the testing. You could possibly have more of a conversation with them up front, but your hands are really tied when they say this is what has to be done outside of what's in the guidelines. Okay, um, so our next question for you, Audrey, is, I thought Thor said that changes in geometry alone would still require a couple of tests. Um, like sensitization and hemo, wouldn't this apply to the shorter catheter? That is a great question. So the shorter catheter actually had the same size and shape. It was the balloon catheter. It's exactly the same and same materials. So it was the length that had changed, and because the surface of the catheter was uh, the same, they did not have to do further testing. And he's right, so you're right that the geometry does affect testing like implantation and hemocompatibility. Um, but when that geometry stays the same, and um, that doesn't need to be further assessed. And it's important to note that not every testing category is concerned with geometry. So not every device is going to have to go through hemocompatibility or implantation. But for those devices where you do go through that, your predicate device is crucial because um, the geometry can affect so much of those results. Okay, um, let's see. Should we update currently released product BERs to align with these requirements? So this would be one of those where um, you're coming in at the end, where the, the project's already been done. It would be great to go through and make sure that the testing you have done for a product is already in line as an internal documentation. Um, it's not required that if you are going to um, maybe submit to a new market, you may want to look at doing it just so you have one on file. And I also want to note that I also have Thor Rollins here to help answer any questions as well. So if you have questions from day one and day two that possibly did not get asked, please feel free to push those through because we can um, address those. And Dr. Campbell, unfortunately, is not here today, but Thor and I can answer her questions, questions for her as well. Okay, great. Good to know. Um, so we have one. Um, what is the criteria used for determining a worst case for colorants in materials? Okay, so a worst case for colorants. When I gave the example for the catheters, the worst case product was to combine and make sure we included all the different colorant options. 
So every color is so different, and even a blue from one color house to another color house is going to be different because of their proprietary recipes. Um, and so there isn't a worst case color that you could choose, but if you do have several color options and you want to have a um, representative member for that family with all those different color options, you want to include all those colors in your biological evaluation. Okay. Um, will all my testing reports and risk assessments be included in a BER? That is a great question, and we've actually gone back and forth about that because it really depends on how you would like to submit it to the agency. Um, we can include those risk assessments and testing reports as appendices and then simply reference those appendices in the BER, or if this is more like a cover letter that goes on a binder and you're tabbing these um, testing reports, we can just simply reference that it will be you know, in this internal document. So it can be catered to your special needs. Great. Um, so a couple more questions. Uh, a gap is identified in the BER, and now more testing is needed. How do I get this addressed without doing another BER? Yeah, I was. Uh, you're hoping at the end that you don't find out about those gaps at the very end when you're doing um, your final conclusion, and so. For, for our policy here, depending on the length of test, what we can do is just hold that BER and not complete that until you've done the testing and then add that in. So we would just keep your report as a draft form, and then when the testing was completed, add that in, make the conclusion, apply to that current testing that was done, and complete the report at that point. Okay. Um, I wrote our BER and submitted it to our regulatory body who has now come back with several questions regarding the biocompatibility. Can Nelson offer some support even if you didn't write the BER? That's a great question. And um, yes, absolutely. You can call us at any stage of the project and we can step in. And so, um, but like I said before, you know, when we do the BER ourselves, we go ahead and offer that service as part of our BER to support you through that submission. And um, in this case, we would do that. It would just come at a consulting fee, um, but we'd be happy to help you with any questions or problems. Okay. Um, that looks like all. that's all we have for you today, Audrey. Um, we want to thank the audience for joining us on all three days. Um, I want to thank MD and DI. Thanks all three of our speakers for um, giving out um, this great information. Um, the presentation will be available shortly in an on-demand format. As a registered user, you will receive an email with detailed information on how you can access the on-demand replay of this course. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been available to listen to the event. Uh, this course is copyright 2016 by MD and DI. The presentation materials are owned by or copyright by Nelson Laboratories. The individual speaker is solely responsible for her content and opinions. I'm Tony Von Grumkow. Thank you for attending this week's course. <laughs>